Good morning. Beautiful Lord's Day. It's a little cooler than it has been, but that's good. It, uh, I guess it should be. It's, it's the middle of December, so uh, it's certainly good to see everyone out this morning. We want to take this opportunity to welcome our visitors. You're uh, certainly our honored guest, and we welcome you back any opportunity you may have. If you would, if you've never filled out a visitor's card for us, we would ask that you do that. It should be located on the back of the pew in front of you, and you can uh, just give that to one of the men here. Just a reminder of our service times. We just finished our 9 a.m. Bible study, and, of course, about to begin our uh, 10 a.m. worship service. We'll meet again this evening at 5 for a worship service, and then um, uh, Wednesday evening at 7 for another Bible study. We also have a Tuesday morning Bible class, if you're able to make that, here at the building at 10 o'clock. We do have several that uh, we want to announce on our uh, sick list and shut-ins. Um, let's remember Dorothy Cullison, Linda McClure. Uh, I believe Linda has got a uh, follow-up visit on December 20th for her uh, cancer. And also Kay Rogers and uh, the those that are just going through issues or got uh, are, are sick at this time. Let's remember Jeff Long as he continues the problems with his eyes. Uh, I believe Martha Martin is out sick this morning as well as Amanda Cossey. I, I know she's got the flu. Uh, there may be others that, uh, that are out. Let's be sure to just look around and check on each other. Our friends and family members that we want to remember, uh, Christina Long's sister, Terry Jones is still waiting on a living liver donor, so let's remember her. Hatley Rogers, which is the Branscombe's uh, neighbor that's battling cancer. Uh, Phyllis Hale's husband, his surgery went well, and he is, re in, he is still recovering from that. Linda Rose's brother, uh, Carmen Baxter's dad, uh, John McPherson, and John Shadowins, and uh, Ruth Milgram's grandmother, uh, Kay Davis, of course, which is Joe Davis' wife and, and Jody's mother, Curtis Christenberry's dad, the Meade's son, uh, Ronnie Cossey's mother, uh, Brenda Fasulo's mother, uh, Sheila Brogdon's brother, and her friend also, Kayla McIntyre, which is um, battling aggressive brain cancer, and also Don's dad. Let's Remember those in our prayers and also those that may be struggling spiritually and in some way let's sit, check on each other, see if there's anything we can do for them. In the way of other announcements, uh, there will be a men's business meeting tonight after the services, so plan for that. Our order of services this morning, our song leader will be Brother, Brother Greg Pillow, and that first song, if you're using a, a song book, will be number 99. They'll also be projected on the screen behind us. The Lord's Supper reading, if you want to mark that in your Bibles, will be from Hebrews 9, 13 through 14. Again, that'll be Hebrews 9, 13 through 14. Brother Tim Johnson will be reading that for us. And also offering the prayer for the, the bread. The prayer for the fruit of the vine will be by Brother Jason Hart. And then the brother for the, or the con prayer for the contribution will be by Brother Michael Fasulo. And then before Mike's lesson, if you want to mark your Bibles, the scripture reading will be taken from Matthew 7, 12 through 14. Matthew 7, 12 through 14, if you want to mark that, Brother Todd Ashley will be reading that before us. And at the close of the service, Brother Joe Davis will lead us in dismissal prayer. We'll begin our services at this time with an opening prayer by Brother Would you bow with me, please? Dear Father in heaven, we're so thankful for the beautiful day that, that you blessed us with, dear Lord. We're thankful for for the opportunity to, to come together as Christians of light, precious faith, dear Lord, and worship you in, in spirit and in truth this morning. And we pray that, that you find that our worship and our, and our hearts is acceptable, dear Lord, and pleasing. Dear Lord, please forgive us of our sins, dear Lord, as we, as we sometimes fail you and, and we 
so thankful for your mercy and, and, and your love and, and just thankful that you're our Father, dear Lord, and just thankful so much for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Came willingly and lived a perfect life and, and died in our stead, dear Lord, so that we may have a hope of eternal salvation with you. And when this life is over, and dear Lord, we pray that as we, as we worship you this morning, dear Lord, that, that we clear our minds and, and that, we, that we examine our hearts and, 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 and make sure that our lives are in accordance with your will and pleasing unto you. Dear Lord, please help us put you first in our lives. Dear Lord, we pray that for those that were mentioned as, as physically sick, and we pray that there are, there are many that here that, that are suffering in some way, in, in some form, of some ailment, dear Lord, or have family men or members that are struggling in some, some way. And Dear Lord, we, we know that, that, that the only peace that we can have comes to you, dear Lord, but we pray that they, they, they get back to the much-wanted health, and, and we pray that we may find comfort, and they may find comfort and strength in you. Lord, we pray that for those that may be struggling spiritually, that are weak in, in faith, dear Lord, and, and we pray earnestly for them, dear Lord, and we pray that something may be said or done, that we can be instruments of you and be good examples and be lights, dear Lord, and, 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 and to motivate and encourage each other to, to come back to you. Dear Lord, please help us to be humble people. Please help us to be confident people. And dear Lord, we pray for wisdom to make the right decisions. Dear Lord, we pray for Brother Mike this morning as he brings our lesson. Dear Lord, we pray for each and every member here, and we're so thankful for the visitors that have come our way. Dear Lord, please help us and encourage, serve as an encouragement to one another, dear Lord. And once again, thank you for your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our first hymn this morning will be number 99, Savior Lead Me Lest I Stray.
number 28. Is it for me, dear Savior? Is it for me, dear Savior, thy glory and thy rest? For me so weak and sinful, oh, shall I be so blessed? Oh, Savior, my Redeemer, what can I but adore? And magnify and praise thee and love thee evermore. Is it for me thy welcome, thy gracious entering? For me thy come, ye blessed, for me so full of sin. Oh, saying 204 number 204 never grow old this is not a lord's supper song but it is the last song we'll sing before the lord's supper number 204 never grow old
To help prepare our mind for the Lord's Supper this morning, we'll be reading from the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. That's Hebrews, chapter 9, verses 13 and 14. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Let him give thanks for the bread. Heavenly Father, we come to you now thanking you for the, this bread. We come to you with a realization that it represents the body of your son Jesus. Lord, we pray that those of us who partake of it today will do so in a way that be pleasing in your sight. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray. Holy Father, we ask you to continue to be with us as individuals as we take of this fruit of the vine. May we all look at ourselves and examine ourselves and take of this in a manner that's pleasing unto you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Apart from the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, we have a separate command to lay by in store, and we'll give thanks for the many blessings we have at this time. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you to give you thanks and praise for the grace and mercy you so richly bestowed upon us. We're so thankful for all that you do. Thank you for the material things that we have. We know that it all comes from you. Be with us now as we've purposed in our hearts to give back a small portion of which that you've given us. Help us to do it cheerfully and help the church here use it in a way that will spread the gospel both here and afar. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Our song after the lesson from God's Word will be number 274, Softly and Tenderly. That'll be our invitation song, encouraging those to obey the gospel. Um, at this time, I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're going to sing number 558, Sweeter as the Years Go By. <clears throat> 558, sweeter as the years go by. No soul of Jesus' love that sought me when I was lost in sin, a wondrous grace that brought me back to his fold again, of life and death of mercy, far deeper than the sea. like to follow along and be reading from Matthew 7, Matthew 7 verses 12 through 14. <clears throat> Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. I'm glad you're here this morning, and I trust you already have your Bible in your hands, and you're prepared to use it as we study together. I encourage you to be back tonight, if at all possible. We'll continue our series of lessons on Bible questions that were sometimes asked that uh, we need to know how to answer. And one of the questions that was asked is, are the Jews still the chosen people of God? And so there are a lot of false concepts and ideas that surround that. And so we're going to take a look at that question tonight. I encourage you to come back and to be here for that. 
You know, spiritually speaking, there are only two roads that we can be on. There is a road that leads to life, and there's a road that leads to destruction. And those are the only two paths that we can possibly uh, be on. There's not a third choice that leads to somewhere between heaven and, and hell or between saved and lost. We're either on the right road or we are on the wrong road. The road to life or the road that leads to destruction. And it's, at some point in time in our life, we can change the road that we're on. In fact, most of us would have to admit that there was a time in our lives that we were on on the road to destruction. That's why we obeyed the gospel. That's why we submitted to the Lord. In Galatians chapter, or in Acts chapter 8 and verse 39, the Ethiopian eunuch went on his way rejoicing. Well, why? Because he realized he'd been on the road leading to destruction, and now by obedience to the gospel, he was on the road that led to life. Not only can we go from the road of destruction to the road of life, we can switch from being on the road of life to the road that leads to destruction. And the brethren in Galatia, chapter 5 and verse 4, Paul wrote to them and said, You have fallen from grace. That is, they were running well, he said in chapter 5, but something hindered them, something interfered with them being, uh, serving the Lord, and now they had fallen away and they were headed toward destruction unless they repented. Not only do we need to realize that it's possible for us to go from life to destruction, but we need to appreciate the fact that the devil is seeking to get you off the right road. The devil is doing everything that he possibly can to get you off the road that leads to life and the road that leads to destruction. In fact, in describing the devil in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, the, uh, Peter said, be sober be vigilant or be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, walks about as a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. That is, he's got his eyes open and he's looking for that opportunity to, to tempt you to do something to get you to fall away and to get on that road that leads to destruction. He tried to do it with the apostles. In, Acts, in, in Luke chapter 22 and verse 31, Simon, Satan has demanded to have you that he may sift you as wheat. If the, you know, if the devil went after the Lord and the devil went after Simon and the devil went after the other apostles, surely he's going to do the very best he can to get his hands on you and I as well. And so if it is possible for us to go from life to death or life to destruction, and while we're on this earth, the devil is doing everything that he possibly can do to get us off the right road, then what can I do to stay on the right road? What can I do to ensure that I don't fall prey to the devil and I stay on that road that leads to life? You know, you and I both have known many people who have at one point in time been on the right road and they were serving the Lord, but something interfered and something happened and they fell away. How can I stay on the road that leads to life? Let me say as we begin to open up our Bibles and raise that question, one thing that I must do if I'm going to stay on the road that leads to life is I've got to learn to be sober-minded and I've got to be watchful. If you go back to that passage in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, the Lord said, or Peter said, be sober-minded, be watchful. Why? For your adversary the devil walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so sober-minded and watchfulness are needed because of what the devil is doing. What does it mean to be sober-minded? I guess the very basic definition of sober is to be free from intoxicants. But it's obviously used in a, in a figurative sense in many passages in the Bible. And the idea of being sober-minded is the idea of being in control of one's thought processes and thus not to be in danger of irrational thinking. To be sober-minded or to be well-composed in mind. I think most of us would have to admit that when we have fallen prey to the devil, it was because we were not rational in our thinking. We were not thinking clearly. We may have been thinking impulsively. We may have been thinking about what we want, but we weren't really thinking in a rational, clear way. In defining this term, BDAX, it, it means to be well-balanced or to be self-controlled, 
to be reasonable. The New International Commentary on the New Testament says it means to be clear-minded. So in, in a world where the devil is out to get me and do everything he can to, to sort of lead me very gradually away from the Lord, I need to be a person that is clear-minded and rational in his thought. What does that mean? What does it mean to be sober-minded? When I look into some other passages, being sober-minded means getting our minds focused on heaven as opposed to the here and the now. If you've got your Bibles, go to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. The apostle Peter said to gird up the loins of your mind or prepare your minds for action. Get ready to serve the Lord. And that requires, he said, being sober-minded. And then listen to the rest of that verse. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I think one thing that Peter was trying to get his readers to appreciate is that in this present life there are trials and there are struggles and we suffer as Christians. And if you want to be faithful to God, you've got to get your mind focused on heaven and set your hope fully there. Would you admit that when you have given prey to temptation, when you've given in to the devil, it has been in a moment in time when you weren't really thinking about heaven. You weren't really thinking about eternity. You weren't really thinking about judgment, but you had your mind thinking about maybe the here and the now or what you wanted. That's not clear thinking. That's not sober-mindedness. So if I'm going to stay on the right road, I've got to be sober-minded in that I've got to get my mind focused on heaven and set my hope fully there. Not only that, I've got to be sober-minded in realizing the end of all things is at hand. First Peter chapter 4, First Peter chapter 4 and in verse 7, the apostle Peter again is trying to encourage people to be sober-minded and self-controlled and not live for the flesh. That's what verses 1 through verse 6 is about. And then he said in verse 7, the end of all things is at hand, therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. There's some debate among commentators as to what the end is of 1 Peter chapter 4. Someday it's the destruction of Jerusalem. I really believe the context probably lends itself better for the end of time. And the idea of it being at hand is not that it was imminent, but that it was the next step in God's plan. This world is going to come to an end. This world is going to be destroyed and we're all going to stand before God and give an account for ourselves. And so the decisions that I make in life are based on the fact that the end is going to come. And therefore, I need to live holy life. I need to live a life in service to God. You remember in 2 Peter 3, when Peter was talking about the, 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 the second coming of Christ, and he said, all of these things are going to be dissolved. Therefore, what manner of person ought you to be in all holy conduct? If this is coming to an end, there's a certain way I need to live. That's being sober-minded. Be sober-minded by getting my hope focused on heaven. Being sober-minded by realizing the end of all things is at hand. And being sober-minded and realizing there is spiritual danger out there and I better keep up my guard. Be sober-minded. That's the passage we begin with. Be watchful for your adversary the devil walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Sober-minded realizes, you know what? There is spiritual danger that is lurking and I better be on guard. Sometimes I wonder how much we have in common with some of those nations that we have talked about in Isaiah 13 to 23. And that is that God gave the warning and they said, not us. We're not going to fall. We're, in, we're strong enough. And I wonder spiritually speaking sometimes if we're not the same way. That God gives warnings and he says there's danger out there. And we think that applies to everybody but to me. And I let down my guard and before I know it, the devil takes advantage of that. You want to stay on the right road, you're going to have to be clear in your thinking. You're going to have to be rational in your thought. That means focused on heaven, realizing the end is at hand and being aware of the spiritual danger. But being aware of the spiritual danger also causes me to be watchful, to be alert to keep awake, to be constantly ready. 
is what this word means. And it's really encouraged throughout the scriptures. It's the idea of being awake and being watchful. Uh, you know, if we know a danger is coming, we typically don't go to, to sleep. I, I know, for example, we, the news, there's tornadoes that went through areas of Kentucky and Tennessee. I, there's one thing I know. If, if a tornado warning is out and they say one that's coming from jo, uh, through Joan, Dawn is not going to let me sleep. She is going to be awake because you're out there. if there's a danger out there, we, you want to be prepared for it. That's what we are. Be awake and be watchful. And spiritually speaking, that's what we've got to do. And, and being watchful means that we watch because of false doctrine. Matthew 16 and verse 6, he said to the apostles, Watch and beware of the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees. You know what that means? The, 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 the apostles, by the way, started... Re- we didn't bring any bread. He's talking about bread. And the Bible tells no, he's not talking about bread. He was talking about their teaching. And what he's saying is, you know what? There are people out there that will teach things that are contrary to the doctrine of Christ. Some of them sound good. Some of them sound appealing. And because I realize there's false doctrine, I better watch and I better be careful to compare everything to the Scriptures and be sure that I can put my finger on a book and a chapter and a verse. I've got to watch, and this is closely connected with the sober-minded, because temptation. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation, for the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know, the apostles were not very watchful on that occasion. The Lord, by the way, had said, Simon, you're going to deny me. Peter said, no. He told the apostles, you're all going to fall away because of me this night, and they said, no. And he said, you need to watch and pray. And you know what they did? They went to sleep. Is it any wonder, by the way, that the apostles fled and that Peter denied the Lord? I've got to watch because I know the temptation is that Sometimes it's subtle. Sometimes it's more blatant. But I tell you what, I better be awake and I better be spiritually aware if I'm going to stay on the right road. And I've got to watch. Maybe this is one of the things that's most important for you and I. Watch yourselves lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the cares of this life. I tell you one thing I've got to watch out is not just the, the devil's temptations to, to lie or to say things I shouldn't say. I've got to watch lest I just get too wrapped up in this life. How many times has the spiritual story been told of somebody that was on the right road but they got on the wrong road because they just allowed their life to be dominated by things of this world. And as it became dominated by things of this world, spiritually they grew weaker, they become more vulnerable, and then an opportunity for the devil was provided. I want to stay on the right road. I hope I'm on that right road, but if once we get on it, we want to stay on it. And that requires us being clear in our thinking and always having our eyes wide open to the dangers that are there. There's something else I need to do. If I'm going to stay on the right road, it's not only to be sober-minded and watchful, I need to read and study the Bible every day. The Lord tells us, in writing to Timothy, He told Timothy to keep a close watch on yourself and on your teaching. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those that hear thee. Now one thing Timothy had to watch was himself. He needed to examine himself in light of the scriptures, but he needed to examine his teaching. What was Timothy's teaching? I'll tell you what Timothy's teaching was. It was the word. Preach the word is what Timothy was told. So if he was keeping an eye on his teaching, what he was keeping an eye on was to be sure that what he was teaching was the word. In fact, earlier in that passage, he was told himself, uh, told to give himself to reading. The old King James and the new King James version say, devote yourself to reading. Newer translations say, devote yourself to the public reading of the scriptures. There's some debate. Some believe that it has to do with the public reading. And if that's the case, what he was telling Timothy is be sure that in everything that you teach, it's based on the scriptures. And that that scripture is being related in your teaching and in your encouragement of others. Let me ask you a question. How often do you spend in the word of God daily? Um... I remember years ago, and I don't necessarily think this is important, but I did a summer work with a congregation. And they would, at the very end of Bible class, every Sunday morning, they would say, can we get a show of hands of everybody that read their Bible every day this week? 
And then the congregation, the elders would go around and they'd count how many people read their Bible every day. I've often wondered, looking back, number one, was everybody telling the truth? You know, do you ever look around in embarrassment? Did somebody ever raise their hand when maybe they really didn't? But I've also wondered whether or not it motivated others to read the Scriptures because they realized I've got to give an account of that. On Sunday morning, they're going to ask for a show of hands, and if I don't raise my hand, everybody's going to see that I didn't read my Bible. Well, I'm not sure that's the best motivation, but i tell you who always knows whether you've spent time in the Bible, and that's God. And the question is not whether or not you'd be embarrassed if brethren knew how little time you spend in the Word of God, but what about the Lord? Would you be pleased with the amount of time that you spend in the Word of God if you had to give a report to Him weekly? Do you know how important the Word of God is? It is the weapon that God has given to me to defend all the fiery darts of the wicked one. You know, we're in a spiritual battle, and in that spiritual battle, we're against the forces of evil, and we've got to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. I can't do it on my own. I'm just not equipped on my own to defeat the fiery darts of the wicked one. I've got to use the armor that God has assigned, and when I do that, I'm strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. You've probably gone through studies of the armor of God. Uh, We do vacation Bible schools, and we talk about every piece of the armor, and we draw a great distinction between it. You've heard me say before, there may be value in that, but the more I've studied, the more I'm just confident that every piece of that armor comes back to one thing. We have to put on the breastplate of righteousness. Well, what's righteousness? Hebrews chapter 4, or Hebrews chapter 5, and in verse 13, it is called the word of righteousness. Second Timothy chapter 4, or chapter 3, the word of God is proper for doctrine, for proof, and for instruction or training when what? In righteousness. Where does righteousness come? It's the word of God. We put on the gospel of peace. What's the gospel? The gospel, he said, is the word of truth which you preach. It's a peace that comes through the word of God. Well, what about the the shield of faith? How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The helmet of salvation. Well, what's God's power to salvation? It is the gospel, Romans 1 and verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then, of course, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Really, while each one of those pieces of armor, there's something to be said as we examine each of those individually. They all ultimately come back to the Word of God. And what the Lord is saying is if you take my Word and you use it and you build a faith on it, You can stand against the fiery darts of the wicked one. We remember very well in Matthew chapter 4 when the devil took his turn at trying to tempt the Lord that Jesus resisted that temptation and he resisted it every time by saying, it is written. It's written. It was a faith based on the word of God. You want to you stand against the fiery darts. You want to stay on that right road. Then you find time to read and study the Bible every day and to feed your faith. You know what happens? It doesn't matter how many years you have spent in service to God. You know, what, what if physically speaking, we talk to somebody. Maybe they're, maybe they're my age. Maybe they're in their 70s. But, you know, you ask them about their health. And I say, well, you know what? I have spent enough in my lifetime eating. I'm not going to eat anymore. You know, I I have spent... I'm just going to rely on what I have eaten in the past. You know what happens very quickly? Somebody like that begins to grow weak. They begin to waste away. And you and I have seen individuals that were once pillars of strength, but when when they... uh, can't eat or they don't eat, then very quickly they, they, they waste away. Do you know what happens spiritually to us if we have that mindset that I have eaten on God's Word, I've spent a lot, and now I'm going to stop doing that. You know what's going to happen to us spiritually? The same thing that happens to us physically when we quit eating. We're going to fall away from the... You want to stay on the right road? Then read your Bible every day. You want to stay on the right road? Then pray every day. Communicate with the Lord in prayer. 
Regular prayer, by the way, is encouraged and commanded throughout the Scriptures. We are to pray without ceasing. Colossians 4 and verse 2, we are to continue steadfastly in prayer. Romans chapter 12 and in verse 12, we are to be constant in prayer. I wonder, do those, do those words describe you in your prayer life? I've said before, and I, I, I would say it again, if there's one area in my life I think I'd really like to, to improve, it's probably my praying to the Lord, to do more fervently and regularly and to learn to pray more like the psalmist and others did. Prayer is just a vital part of the, the Christian life. Why is there value, by the way, in regular prayer? What's the value in prayer? When I'm praying to God regularly, what does that do for me? Well, first of all, let me just say there's power in prayer. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. By the way, if, if time permitted, we could go to that passage in James chapter 5 and look at the context. There's power in prayer when you're sick. There's power in prayer when you're, when you're uh, sad. There's power in prayer when you are battling sin. All of that is seen in that entire context. Uh, James 5, 13 through 18. So when I use the power of prayer, I'm unlocking something that is powerful. When I'm praying to God... It can provide help in the time of temptation. I want to tell you what prayer is not. Prayer is not just something that we go through uh, as a matter of rote and repeat the same words day in and, and day out with a little thought. Prayer is not just us going to God and thanking Him for our physical blessings and our spiritual blessings. Prayer is a means that God has given to us to help us in the time of temptation. In Hebrews chapter 4, he talks about how we can come boldly to the throne of grace that we may find help in the time of need. Matthew 26, 41, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. I just wonder how much the, how the things on the knife of our Lord's betrayal would have been different if Peter and James and John had got on their knees together and said, we need to pray about what we're about to face. We need to ask for God's help. Through these difficulties, God can do that. I don't always know how he does it, but in the time of temptation, and I think one thing we probably need to do and be more specific about, first of all, is being honest with ourselves. We know what temptations we're facing. We know whether we're facing the temptation at work to say something we shouldn't say. I know whether or not I'm facing temptation and, and, and dealing with others to say angry words. Whatever specific temptation I'm praying about, I need to take it to the Lord and say, Lord, help me learn to put bridle on my tongue. Lord, help me to choose the way of escape in, in this area. And I tell you, when I do that, I think there's power in prayer to help keep me on the right road. I tell you what, prayer can help us focus on others. When I'm praying as I should, I make supplications for all the saints. And not only that, I'm praying for those that abuse me and use me. I tell you what, if I'm struggling to have the right attitude toward my leaders, for example, let's say I'm having the, so I, I'm struggling to have proper attitude and proper respect toward our political leaders. They don't make it easy sometimes. But I tell you what can help sometimes is when I'm praying to the Lord and I'm praying for our leaders that they'll make good decisions and lead us in the right way. Sometimes just that focusing and praying can help remind me of what my attitude needs to be. It helps me to realize how blessed I am when I pray for others and get my attention off myself and get my attention on others. It focuses on God and His Word. Matthew chapter 6, 10, 11, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Tell you, when I'm praying not for the kingdom to come, but I'm praying about spiritual things, it gets my mind directed on spiritual things. It reminds me of where my blessings come from and how blessed I am. It reminds us of our blessings and it helps to bring peace that passes all understanding. I tell you, you, you find yourself struggling spiritually and wondering about where the, where's God in all of this. Take time to get down on your knees and just... One by one, start counting your blessings. I tell you what the Lord said. He said in Philippians chapter 4 through 6 through the Apostle Paul, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. 
Remind yourself of all of those blessings and you'll have a peace that surpasses all understanding, a peace that the world cannot appreciate. And I tell you what happens, as we draw near to God, you know what happens? God draws near to us. We develop that closer relationship with the Lord in prayer. As we communicate with Him through prayer and He communicates to us through His Word, then what happens is we're growing stronger spiritually. Our resistance to the devil is stronger and we can stay on the right road. How can I stay on that right road? I need to be sober. I need to clear in my thinking. I better keep my guard up. I better read the Bible every day. I need to pray every day. I need to attend all the services of God's people that you can. God expects us to be here when we can. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. God's saying when you can be here, you need to be here. And there are times that we're legitimately hindered. There's sickness and age and other things that keep us from being here. Care for other people, care for the aged. There are sometimes reasons we can't be here, but what Paul is saying, or the Hebrew writer, if it is Paul, is when you can be here, you need to be here. Do you know why God demanded the assembly? Do you know, do you know why God put this in part of his plan, that we should come here... Uh, as much as we could. And by the way, being hindered from being here is different than simply choosing not to be here. But do you realize that God did all of this for you? This is for my benefit. God did not say we need to come together and worship Him because He needs anything. He has not worshipped with men's hands as though He needed anything since He gives to all life and breath and all things. God wants my worship. Listen, God wants my adoration. He wants my service. God does not need it. He does not need my worship unto Him. He covets that. But what Hebrew writer said in Hebrews 10 and verse 24, he said, is let us consider how to stir one another up into love and to good work. The assembly is designed for our value and our benefit of seeing others that are trying to serve the Lord. And our coming together, God expects it to be for the better, not for the worst. It's to be for our upbuilding and our encouragement. Sometimes when we spend a life out, uh, a week out in the world, and we battle temptation and sin, it's good to come and to look around and see individuals that are striving with you to serve the Lord, who, are, who have the same goal as what you have. To open up our Bibles and to study, to sing songs, to hear brethren pray together. All of that is for our value. Now, one thing we have to realize is we only get out of worship what we put into it. If we don't put forth effort into it, then we're not going to get anything out of it. And so we come with our hearts open and and with the right attitude, and we miss something when we're not here. I want to tell you something. When we're not here, even when it's legitimate, we miss something. We miss something. John 10 and verse 24, there's a statement that is made. The apostles came together, and this is after the Lord's death and his resurrection, and the Lord appeared to them, and the Bible just simply said, but Thomas wasn't there. I'm going to be honest. I don't know why Thomas wasn't there. But Thomas might have been home in bed with the flu. I don't know. He might have had some other reason that Thomas wasn't there. But I want to tell you, when Thomas wasn't there, you know what he missed? He missed the peace and the encouragement that came from being with the Lord. And he had to wait an entire week before he saw the Lord. In fact, it wasn't until then that he finally had the same understanding that the apostles gained a week ago. My point is simply this. When we're not here legitimate or not, we miss an opportunity. You want to stay on the right road? You want to stay on that road that leads to life? I tell you what you need to do. You need to try to attend all the services of God's people that you can. To be with those that will encourage and help us in our service to God. And finally, let me say, you need to remember and use God's second law of pardon. The reality is that we should strive not to sin and live faithful lives to the Lord. I hope that's your goal. I, I, your goal is to sin not. I tell you, that's my goal in life. My, my little children, these things I write to you that you sin not. There's just nothing good about sin. Nothing positive about sin. And so my goal in life, my, what my striving is, I want to choose the way of, uh, of escape from temptation every time it's presented my way. I want to choose not to sin, but I want to tell you, there are times I've failed in life. 
And there are times you failed in that. In fact, you know what John would say? John said, if we say we haven't sinned, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And I wish I could sort of stand before you and say, you know, I remember that day that I obeyed the gospel. I've been a member of the Lord's Church for 40 years. And I wish I could sort of stand before you and say, you know, in the last 40 years, I've just lived a perfect life. And I've never sinned, and I've never made a mistake, and I've always done the right thing, and I've always had the right attitude. But the reality is that none of us can really say that. We've, we've fallen at times. We've failed at times. And, and, and we've got to always keep up that guard. But there's something that, that gives me encouragement, and that is God has provided a second law of pardon. We say a second law. The first law of pardon is the hear, believe, repent, and confess, and be baptized that applies to us becoming a child of God initially. But when we sin after we have obeyed the gospel, I tell you what, I just don't have to fold my hands and just throw them up and say, it's, it's all over. Simon the sorcerer tried to buy the gift of God with money, and what happened in Acts 8 is the apostle Peter said, Repent of this thy wickedness, and pray to God that perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. I'm lucky and you're lucky that we have an advocate with God, Jesus Christ the righteous. When we sin, I've got one I can turn to that will plead my case before God. But listen, that forgiveness is conditional. It's conditional. It is conditioned upon, first of all, me confessing my sin. 1 John 1 and verse. If we confess our sin. There are some that, by the way, have taught that the forgiveness of 1 John chapter 1 is automatic. Just even as we sin, the we're automatically forgiven without us ever meeting any conditions on our part. I want to tell you, if they read 1 John chapter 1, if is a condition. If we confess our sins, if we acknowledge it, if we take responsibility for what we've done, and we repent of that sin, that is, we make the decision we're going to turn. Godly sorrow produces repentance. You know what happens when we use that second law of pardon? When I've said something I shouldn't do that's sinful, not that I, just that I use poor judgment. That I said something I shouldn't do, and I acknowledge that to the one I have wronged, and I say, I'm, I'm going to do my best not to do that anymore, and I acknowledge it to God, and I ask Him for forgiveness. You know what the Bible says? He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. So that now I can have confidence that I made a mistake, I got on that wrong road, but I turned back to God, and now I'm back where I need to be. Where would I be? Where would you be without that second law of pardon? You want to stay on the right road? That's tell you what it's going to require. It's going to require a heart of humility, a heart of genuineness that is willing to acknowledge their sins and turn back to God when they failed. And I'll tell you what I believe. I believe that if I think clearly and I get my mind focused on heaven and the end of time and the dangers I'm, I'm watching for them, and I read my Bible and I pray every day, and I'm here when the doors are open to get the encouragement and to give the encouragement of God's people. And I have a heart that's willing to acknowledge and to use God's second law of pardon. Then despite the best efforts of the wicked one, I can stay on the right road. What is your condition this morning? It could be that there's somebody here that's never obeyed the gospel. Somebody here that is not yet a child of God. And you need to obey the gospel this very morning so that you can get on that road that leads to life. Hearing, believing, repenting, confession, and being baptized, you'll arise from those waters with your sins washed away. Then strive to serve the Lord faithless. You'll have that home in heaven. Or maybe there's somebody that's obeyed the gospel and wandered away and needs to come back. No matter what your need is, take advantage of this opportunity. Respond right now as we stand and we sing. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching. Watching for you and for me. Come home, come home. You are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. Calling, oh sinner, come home. Why should we tarry when Jesus is pleading? Pleading for you. See?
mercies for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling. morning. It's encouragement to have us all together. And I want to encourage everyone to come back again this evening at 5 and make plans to be here for our Bible study on uh, Wednesday night as well. Number uh, 128 is our closing hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be. Take my life and let it be Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we could come together and worship with thee. We pray that you'll help us as we go through our life. We realize there are two roads that we can follow. We pray that you'll help us to stay on the right road, and we pray that you will help us to be sober-minded in the things that we do in our life. We pray that people look at us and the example that we set as Christians and want to be that way. Help us to spread the word through our word of mouth as well as our actions as far as Christianity is concerned. We pray that you'll help us to be watchful in our life that we will constantly realize that temptation's out there and our temptation may be different from other people. We pray that you'll help us to be watchful in that fact and do the best we possibly can to avoid the devil getting us in, on the wrong road. We pray that you'll help us to always Study our Bible and do the best we possibly can to read what you've had us do as Christians in our life. 
pray that you'll help us to be prayerful in our life, that we will constantly pray to thee, rely upon thee to help us in times of problems, and realize that if we have to go on our own will, we may fail and go down the wrong road. We pray that you'll always be mindful of us and help us to look out for other people that are in need, especially our brothers and sisters that may be spiritually sick. Pray that you'll help us to do the best we possibly can to help them out through their troublesome times. We pray for the members of this congregation which may be having illness at this time or have lost, lost, lost ones or having surgery. Be with them and give them strength. Help us to always be mindful of the faith that we have and help us to stay strong in our faith and do the best we possibly can to do the things be pleasing unto thee. We pray that you be with us now as we leave this building, that you give us a safe journey to where we're going and give us a safe journey back to join you in the next appointed time. These things we ask in Jesus' name.